Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and I'm here today with Henry. Hi. And today we're taking a look at the 28th president of the United States. Who is it, Henry? Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. Very good. And we got a lot of really fun things to tell you about Woodrow Wilson, such as he does have some New Jersey ties that we're going to tell you about, believe it or not, in our home state here in New Jersey. But first, before we get into the 28th president of the United States, what do the people have to do, Henry? Hit the subscribe down below, leave all your comments and questions, hit the bell, and give the like. That's and right. Comes, yeah. And what else? Comments and questions. Comments and questions, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Hit subscribe down below. Of course, subscribe to the channel. Likes, comments, questions, thumbs up, all that stuff. Of course, hit that little notification bell. So you can be notified because we do put out videos when, Henry? Every single week. Every single week, that's right. So now we're going to start to get into the 28th president of the United States, the guy behind us, Woodrow Wilson. And this is... Dead History. Dead History. Hey guys, we're back. TJ here with Henry. And yep, the guy behind us, the 28th president of the United States. Who, Henry? Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson. That's a tough one for you to say. And please, excuse Henry's mouth right now. It looks like he ate a Smurf or something like that, but he actually just recently ate a Sonic the Hedgehog ice cream bar from the Ice Cream Man. Yeah. So yeah, his lips are all blue. <laughs> so I told him it looks like he ate a Smurf, right, Henry? <laughs> So, our 28th president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, we have some fascinating things to tell you. Like, being from New Jersey, home state here, Woodrow Wilson's not from New Jersey, but he has New Jersey ties. Such as, he was the president of Princeton University, the college here. That's one thing, right, Henry? Yeah. And another thing is, he was also the governor of the state of New Jersey. So, yeah, pretty interesting stuff, right? I thought that was cool, right? Yeah. Also, he is the only president to actually be buried in Washington, D.C. Yep, at the National Cathedral, and we're going to show you that later. And last, but certainly not least, Woodrow Wilson was the first president ever to have to deal with a world war. World War I happened when Woodrow Wilson was in office. So we're going to get into all of that fascinating stuff. You did the likes, you did the subscribes, you did all the comments, questions, all that stuff. Of course, the notification bell. Henry, your famous line. Tell them what they got to do now. Get the potato chips or soda. <laughs> That's right. Get the potato chips, the soda, the popcorn, whatever you get. The pretzels. The pretzels. <laughs> That's right. Go get it. And sit back and relax and enjoy our next presidential series installment, taking a look at the 20... Eight. 28th president of the United States. Good job, Woodrow Wilson. Enjoy. Hey guys, welcome. This is TJ with Dead History, and welcome to our next presidential series installment, taking a look at the 28th president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. And I am here with Henry. Hi. And we are getting set here just to uh, tell you all about the early life, the birthplace, and the childhood, and all that stuff of Woodrow Wilson. And then, of course, we'll lead you pretty much all the way up to his presidency in part one here. Um, so we're going to jump right in, right, Henry? Going to jump right in here? Yep, yep, yep. We're going to drive right in. All right, here we go. So Thomas Woodrow Wilson was born to a family of Scots, Irish, and Scottish descent in Stanton, Virginia. He was the third of four children and the first son of Joseph Ruggles Wilson and Jesse Janet Woodrow. Wilson's paternal grandparents had immigrated to the United States from Strabane, County Tyrone, Ireland in 1807, settling in Steubenville, Ohio. His grandfather, James Wilson, published a pro-tariff and anti-slavery newspaper, the Western Herald and Gazette. Wilson's maternal grandfather, Reverend Thomas Woodrow, moved from Paisley, Scotland, to Carlisle, England, before migrating to Chilcot, or Chilchot, Ohio, in the late 1830s. Joseph met Jessie while she was attending a girls' academy in Steubenville, and the two married on June 7th of 1849. Soon after the wedding, 
Joseph was ordained as a Presbyterian pastor and assigned to serve, serve in Stanton. Thomas was born in the Manse, a house of the Stanton First Presbyterian Church where Joseph served. Before he was two, the family moved to Augusta, Georgia. Wilson's earliest memory was of playing in his yard and standing near the front gate of the Augusta Parsonage at the age of three when he heard a passerby announce in disgust that Abraham Lincoln had been elected and that a war was coming. Wilson's parents identified with the southern United States and were staunch supporters of the Confederacy during the American Civil War. Wilson's father was one of the founders of the Southern Presbyterian Church in the United States. And after, I'm sorry, after it split from the Northern Presbyterians in 1861, he became minister of the First Presbyterian Church in Augusta, and the family lived there until 1870. From 1870 to 1874, Wilson lived in Columbia, South Carolina, where his father was a theology professor at the Columbia Theological Seminary. In 1873, Wilson became a communicant member of the Columbia First Presbyterian Church. He remained a member throughout his life. So just so you guys know, and I'm going to show here on the uh, screen, uh, I told Henry this story. So his uh, home and birthplace there in Stanton, Virginia, it is spelled S-T-A-U-N-T-O-N, but it's not pronounced Staunton, it's pronounced Stanton, Virginia. I actually visited here back in 2016 by accident. Yeah, I, yeah right? Remember I told you this, yeah. right, Henry? Yep, Mom, Dad was taking a car trip with his brother, and uh, suddenly um, they ended up in well, Woodrow Wilson's house. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah, Henry's right. So what happened was um, my brother also, you know, born and raised here in New Jersey, he is uh, married and, you know, he, he has uh, two children. Well, he actually has uh, uh, three children, one from his previous marriage, his first marriage. But he has two children with his, you know, his wife now, my sister-in-law. And they were moving their family from New Jersey to Texas, to Austin, Texas. So they had asked me if I would drive one of their cars and we were going to caravan down to Texas. My brother was driving a U-Haul truck. My sister-in-law was driving her newer Ford car. And I was driving my brother's car. Well, long story short, my sister-in-law's car had some trouble. There uh, just seemed to be something mechanical. There was a light coming on that shouldn't have been coming on. And long story short, they Googled where the closest Ford dealership was. And it happened to be in a town called Stanton, Virginia. And when we were getting off the exit, I had noticed a sign that said, Woodrow Wilson's home and birthplace, like two miles down the road. So, when we found out that it was going to be a few hours before the car was ready at the dealership, I decided by myself to take a little stroll about a mile down the road from the dealership, and I took a tour. Uh, I actually paid for the tour of Woodrow Wilson's birthplace house. Now, all these photos that you're seeing, unfortunately, these are stock photos that I found online, Google Photos, of the home. Because the photos, I only took about two or three photos. So it's not like I took a lot. But these photos that I took are lost forever. My original Facebook page that I had for like 15 or more years somehow got deactivated and deleted. Um, and I fought tooth and nail with Facebook, but it was gone forever. And those pictures were in an album on that Facebook page. So unfortunately, those are gone. But like I said, there was only about two or three of those photos that I had taken because this was well before. This was about four years before I had ever started my gravesite tour. Yeah, way back in like 2018. 16, yep. 16. 2016, yeah. So this was before any of that. Like I said, I had only taken a couple pictures anyway of the outside. So these pictures you're seeing are not mine, but I have been to Woodrow Wilson's birthplace and childhood home, well, at least where he lived for a couple years, the first two years of his life, in Stanton, Virginia. Um, pretty cool. Just by accident, I had visited there. So I uh, just wanted to mention that. And yes, for uh, those of you wondering, he did move and lived uh, most of his childhood in Augusta, Georgia, the same Augusta, Georgia, where Augusta National is, where they play the Masters every year. So... 
Uh, pretty cool stuff for you sports fans and you golf fans out there. So here we go. Woodrow Wilson, he attended Davidson College in North Carolina for the 1873-74 school year, but he transferred as a freshman to the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton University. He studied political philosophy and history, and he joined the Phi Kappa Phi, uh, Phi, Phi Kappa Pi, I'm sorry, Phi Kappa Pi fraternity, and was active in the Whig Literary and Debating Society. He was also elected secretary of the school's football association, president of the school's baseball association, and managing editor of the student newspaper. In the hotly contested presidential election of 1876, Woodrow Wilson declared his support for the Democratic Party and its nominee, Samuel J. Tilden. After graduating from Princeton in 1879, Woodrow Wilson attended the University of Virginia School of Law, where he was involved in the Virginia Glee Club and served as president of the Jefferson Literary and Debating Society. After poor health forced his withdrawal from the University of Virginia, he continued to study law on his own while living with his parents in Wilmington, North Carolina. Woodrow Wilson was admitted to the Georgia Bar and made a brief attempt at establishing a legal practice in Atlanta in 1882. Though he found legal history in uh, substantive uh, judiciary interesting, he abhorred the day-to-day procedural aspects. Could not stand it. Found it was just so boring. So after less than a year, he abandoned his legal practice to pursue the study of political science and history. So we're going to get into a little more fun facts about his childhood and stuff, but uh, we're going to keep moving forward right now. So there you go, Stanton, Virginia. I was there. Um, And yeah, but pretty cool stuff where he was uh, born. I've never been to his home. Uh, You've probably seen some pictures on the screen. Again, stock photos I found on Google. I've never been to Woodrow Wilson's home in Augusta, Georgia, or, or any of those other places, but... Um, so there marriage, uh, in 1883, Woodrow Wilson met and fell in love with Ellen Louise Axon, the daughter of a Presbyterian minister from Savannah, Georgia. He proposed marriage in September of 1883. She accepted, but they agreed to postpone marriage while Wilson attended graduate school. Ellen graduated from arts students league of New York and worked in a portraiture and received a medal for one of her works from the Exposition Universelle in Paris. She agreed to sacrifice further independent artistic pursuits in order to marry Wilson in 1885. She learned German that shows she could help translate works of political science that were relevant to Wilson's research. Their first child together, Margaret, she was born in April of 1886. Then their second... Jesse was born in August of 1887. Their third and final child, Eleanor, was born in October of 1889. And in 1913, Jesse married Francis Bose Sayre Sr., who later was High Commissioner to the Philippines. And in 1914, Eleanor married William Gibbs McAdoo, the Secretary of the Treasury under Wilson and later a Senator for California. So his daughters uh, married into uh, very political um, ties and political uh, men. So Wilson being a professor in late 1883, Woodrow Wilson enrolled at the recently established John Hopkins University in Baltimore for doctoral studies. Built on the model of higher education, Johns Hopkins was inspired particularly from Germany's historic Heidelberg University, in that it was committed to research as a central part of its academic mission. Wilson studied history, political science, German, and other areas. Wilson hoped to become a professor, writing that a professorship was the only feasible place for me, the only place that would afford leisure for reading and for original work, the only strictly literary birth with an income attached. Wilson spent much of his time at John Hopkins writing Congressional Government, a study in American politics, which grew out of a series of essays in which he examined the workings of the federal government. 
Wilson received a PhD in history and government from Johns Hopkins in 1886, making him the only U.S. president who possessed a PhD. It's pretty interesting, right, Henry? He's the only one ever, so far at least, to ever hold a PhD. Pretty cool. In early 1885, Houghton Mifflin published Congressional Government, which received a strong reception. One critic called it the best critical writing on the American Constitution, which has appeared since the Federalist Papers. You got to excuse Henry sniffling a bit because he's uh, battling his allergies, right, Henry? Yep. Pollen is crazy here in New Jersey right now, isn't it? Uh-huh. <laughs> How you feeling? You doing all right? Yeah. All right, good. So in 1885, Wilson accepted a teaching position at Bryn Mawr College, a newly established women's college on the Philadelphia Main Line. Wilson taught at Bryn Mawr College from 1885 until 1888. He taught ancient Greek and Roman history, American history, political science, and other subjects. There were only 42 students, nearly all of them too passive for his taste. M. Carey Thomas, the dean, was an aggressive feminist, and Wilson was in a bitter dispute with the president about his contract. He left as soon as possible and was not given a farewell. <clears throat> in 1888, Wilson left Bryn Mawr for the all-male Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. At Wesleyan, he coached the football team, founded a debate team, and he taught graduate courses in political economy and Western history. And in February of 1890, with the help of some friends, Woodrow Wilson was appointed by Princeton to the chair of uh, Judiciary and Political Economy at an annual salary of $3,000, which is the equivalent to about $90,000 this day and age. He quickly gained a reputation as a compelling speaker, and in 1896, Francis Landy Patton announced that the College of New Jersey would henceforth be known as Princeton University. An ambitious program of expansion followed with the name change. In the 1896 presidential election, Woodrow Wilson rejected Democratic nominee William Jennings Bryant as too far to the left. He supported the conservative gold Democrat nominee, John M. Palmer. Wilson's academic reputation continued to grow throughout the 1890s, and he turned down multiple positions elsewhere, including at Johns Hopkins and the University of Virginia. And Wilson went on to publish several works of history and political science, and was a regular contributor to Political Science Quarterly. Wilson's textbook, The State, was widely used in American college courses until the 1920s. Pretty interesting. Now, the president of Princeton University. In June of 1902, Princeton trustees promoted Professor Wilson to president, replacing Patton, whom the trustees perceived to be an inefficient administrator. Wilson aspired, and he told alumni, to transfer thoughtless boys performing tasks into thinking men. He tried to raise admission standards and to replace the gentleman's C with serious study. To emphasize the development of expertise, Wilson instituted academic departments and a system of core requirements. So, a lot about Princeton, but he was uh, the president of Princeton University. Uh, for anybody that's ever been to New Jersey, Princeton University is an Ivy League school. And Princeton, New Jersey is one of the prettiest and most historic and quaint and most beautiful towns you will ever visit. Um, and Princeton University is beautiful. Henry's been to Princeton a few times, seeing uh, Grover Cleveland's gravesite with me. Right, Henry? Yep. And Princeton's nice, right? We've been around the uh, yeah, university yeah, and stuff. Yeah, it's really nice. Really nice. I know. It's a beautiful town. So, very bougie, as they say. So, Governor of New Jersey, by January of 1910, Wilson had drawn the attention of James Smith Jr. and George Britton McClellan Harvey, two leaders of New Jersey's Democratic Party, as a potential candidate in the upcoming gubernatorial election. 
Having lost the last five gubernatorial elections, New Jersey Democratic leaders decided to throw their support behind Wilson, an untested and unconventional candidate. Party leaders believe that Wilson's academic reputation made him the ideal spokesman against trust and corruption, but they also hoped his inexperience in governing would make him easy to influence. Wilson agreed to accept the nomination if it came to me unsought, unanimous, unanimously, and without pledges to anybody about anything. And at the state party convention, the bosses marshaled their forces and won the nomination for Wilson. He submitted his letter of res resignation to Princeton on October 20th. Wilson's campaign focused on his promise to be independent of party bosses. He quickly shed his professional style for a more emboldened speech-making and presented himself as a full-fledged progressive. Though the Republican William Howard Taft had carried New Jersey in the 1908 presidential election by more than 82,000 votes, Woodrow Wilson soundly defeated Republican gubernatorial nominee Vivian M. Lewis by a margin of more than 65,000 votes. Democrats also took control of the General Assembly in the 1910 elections through the state Senate. Oh, I'm sorry, though the state Senate remained in Republican hands. After winning the election, Woodrow Wilson appointed Joseph Patrick Tumulty as his private secretary, a position he would hold throughout Wilson's political career. So that kind of leads us all the way up to his presidential, you know, nomination and election uh, of 1912. Um, so some fun things I want to tell you here about Wilson, uh, because we, you know, we went through childhood, birthplace, growing up, all that stuff. Right, Henry? Yep. You know, Stanton, Virginia, where daddy was, but uh, his pictures are lost, right? Yes. Um, so let's see some fun things. Hold on here. So these are just some fun, quick facts about Wilson. As I said, his father, Joseph Ruggles Wilson, was pastor of Wilmington's First Presbyterian Church from 1874 to 1882. Young Woodrow Wilson was born in 1856 in Stanton, Virginia, and he lived in Wilmington while taking a year off between his freshman year at Davidson College and his sophomore year when he transferred to Princeton. A plaque to Wilson can be found at the First Presbyterian Church there in Wilmington. So pretty cool stuff. Um, Woodrow Wilson was apparently the first person to ride a two-wheeled bicycle in Wilmington. Interesting. This is actually something that was proven by local historian Diane Cashman that Woodrow Wilson was the very first person to ever ride a two-wheeled bicycle in Wilmington. Interesting stuff. According to biographer Eric Montgomery, Woodrow Wilson dreamed of going to sea and spent a lot of time sitting down at the Wilmington docks watching ships. He had a fascination with the sea, uh, according to a historian. To keep his mind sharp, though, he actually sat in on some classes at Wilmington's Tilliston School and was tutored by its headmaster, Amy Bradley. Most people in Wilmington knew Woodrow Wilson as Tom or Tommy. Thomas was his first name. And according to historian Montgomery, he didn't start going by Woodrow until he entered law school because he thought it sounded more impressive. So his first name was Thomas, but he didn't start going by the name of Woodrow, his middle name, until he was actually in law school. So pretty cool, right, Henry? Yeah. Another Thomas, technically, as president. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So, um, on the other hand, speaking about law school and his education, he actually, Woodrow Wilson did not learn to read and write until he was 11. The Civil War was actually a bit of a distraction, and why? Yeah. I'm going to get into some interesting facts about the Civil War in, in Wilson here in a second. As I said, Woodrow Wilson, he married Edith Bolling-Galt in 1915. This is actually something I didn't mention. I'm sorry. Uh, after his first, wife, his first wife died, Edith Bolling-Galt in 1915. 
He was only one of three presidents to ever marry, ever marry while he was in office. John Tyler and Grover Cleveland were the other two. And we're going to get into more about that and that uh, marriage uh, in part two during his presidency years. This is really cool. Henry, you'll like this. Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, experienced the Civil War as a youth. Born on December 28th of 1856 in Virginia, a young Thomas Woodrow Wilson was present in Georgia when Union troops entered his town and his mother tended to wounded Confederate soldiers. Here's another thing. Like I said, he was an eyewitness to the Civil War. Born and raised in the South, Woodrow Wilson was the son of a Presbyterian minister, Joseph Wilson, and his wife, Janet Wilson. His parents were Confederate supporters, and as a child, Woodrow Wilson watched Janet nurse wounded soldiers in his father's church. Later, he witnessed Confederate President Jefferson Davis marched in chains through Augusta, Georgia. So that's pretty interesting and cool. Also as a child, Woodrow Wilson saw Robert E. Lee. A young 13-year-old Tommy Woodrow Wilson and his father were at a procession in Augusta, Georgia, and the future president stood next to General Lee at the event. So there you go. He not only saw Jefferson Davis in chains as a young boy, he also met and stood right next to Robert E. Lee. So a lot of Civil War. uh, He was an eyewitness to a lot of Civil War stuff as a kid. So as I said, Wilson did eventually attend Princeton as a student. After a brief time at Davidson College, Wilson wound up in New Jersey at Princeton, where he graduated 38th in his class of 167 students. Wilson was a professional historian and a political scientist. After a brief law career, Woodrow Wilson settled into an academic career that lasted until 1910. He was a professor at other schools and then returned to Princeton where, as I said, he was named president of Princeton in 1902. This is cool. I thought this was interesting. Woodrow Wilson had a, a little over two years of political experience when he became president. After his Princeton career, Wilson won the election as New Jersey's governor in 1910. And only two years later, he was in the White House. So he really did not have much of a political career um, before he became president. Pretty crazy. Um, So I'm going to just read you one more little uh, paragraph and a half here, and then we'll wrap up part one. It's just more of a synopsis of his early years. Thomas Woodrow Wilson, born on December 28th of 1856 in Stanton, Virginia. Because his mother said he arrived around midnight, some sources list Wilson's birthday as December 29th. Interesting fact. His father, Joseph Ruggles Wilson, was a Presbyterian minister, and his mother, Janet Woodrow Wilson, was a minister's daughter and originally from England. Tommy Wilson, as he was called growing up, spent his childhood in teen years in Augusta, Georgia, and Columbia, South Carolina. During the American Civil War, Wilson's father served as a chaplain in the Confederate Army and used his church as a hospital for injured Confederate troops. Um, did you know, little, little side, side fun note here, Woodrow Wilson, who had a career as an academic and university president before entering politics, he did not learn to read until he was like 10 or 11, likely due to distractions of the Civil War and dyslexia. Interesting. So here we go. Doing okay over there, little allergy boy? Yep. <laughs> Wilson graduated from Princeton University, it was then called the College of New Jersey, in 1879, and he went on to attend law school at the University of Virginia. After briefly practicing law in Atlanta, Georgia, he received a Ph.D. in political science from Johns Hopkins University in 1886. Wilson remains the only U.S. president to earn a doctorate degree. He taught at Bryn Mawr College and Wesleyan College before being hired by Princeton in 1890 as a professor uh, of judiciary and politics. Uh, From 1902 to 1910, Wilson was president of Princeton, where he developed a national reputation for his educational reform policies. During his tenure, however, he also prevented enrollment of black students at the university. 
And in 1902, Wilson published a five-volume textbook, The History of the American People, which presented a romanticized view of the Confederacy and described the Ku Klux Klan, a violent terrorist group, as roving knights errant, an invisible empire of the South bound together in loose organization to protect the southern country of some of the ugliest hazards of a time of revolution. So we are going to get into this a little later in part two, but Wilson was not exactly very, very good when it came to um, segregation and, uh, you know, being progressive when it came to uh, black rights and that sort of thing. And we're going to learn all about that. In 1885, Wilson married Ellen Axon, a minister's daughter, and Georgia native. The couple had three daughters before Ellen died of kidney disease in 1914 during her husband's first presidential term. The following year, Wilson married Edith Bowling Galt, a widow whose husband had owned a Washington, D.C. jewelry business. So in 1910, Woodrow Wilson was elected the governor of New Jersey where he fought machine politics and garnered national attention as a progressive reformer. In 1912, the Democrats nominated Wilson for president, selecting Thomas Marshall, the governor of Indiana, as his vice presidential running mate. The Republican Party split over their choice for a presidential candidate. Conservative Republicans renominated President William Taft, while the progressive wing broke off to form the progressive or Bull Moose Party, and nominated Theodore Roosevelt, who had served as president from 1901 to 1909. With the Republicans divided, Wilson, who campaigned on a platform of liberal reform, won the election, and he garnered nearly 42% of the popular vote. Roosevelt came in second with more than 27% of the popular vote. And that kind of leads us right up to the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. So, this was a look at his childhood, his birthplace there in Stanton, Virginia, that I have visited just by mistake. Yeah. And, you know, his early life, Princeton University, uh, his early political career, which wasn't much, only a couple years before he uh, became president. So, not much of a political career, but definitely a very educated man. And in part two, we're going to take a look at his presidency, his legacy, a bit of controversy surrounding Wilson and his beliefs and his ideals. And then, of course, we're going to take a look at World War I because Woodrow Wilson, he was the president when World War I took place. And then we're going to take a look at his death and his gravesite, the only president buried in Washington, D.C. at the National Cathedral. So I hope you enjoyed this part one. Right, Henry? Yep. Hon, did we go see what his gravesite at Washington? Did? So that's a great point. We actually... I've been to the National Cathedral a few times. Henry and I went there last summer, but it has been closed for over a year due to COVID. So you can't go inside to see his tomb. So he is one of only about two or three presidents that I have not actually stood right at his tomb. I've probably been about 20 yards away right outside the doors of the National Cathedral. And I do have pictures of Henry and I visiting the National Cathedral, but... Unfortunately, we'll have to use stock photos for his actual tomb because that's inside the cathedral. So, no, we haven't actually seen that, you know, face to face, uh, Henry. It's a good question. So, uh, but we'll get into that in part two. So, thanks for everything, guys. Thanks for the support, right, Henry? Yep, thanks a lot. Thank you. We want to thank who we want to thank. Oh, Gracie. Rich, Gracie, Richard, L Laser World. Laser World, uh, Rebecca, right? Rebecca. Yep, Les. Less yes. over, over, all the way over in England, right? All these guys. Uh, Dominic and Noah. Uh, you know, Noah, he's always leaving comments. Noah. Yep. Baby. So we thank you so much for all the support, the comments, the questions. Please keep them up. Subscribe. Tell your friends. We really appreciate it. We love doing this. And we will see you tomorrow for part two of Woodrow Wilson. Bye-bye now, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.